On the 29th of April 2021, we celebrated in IES Donoso Cortés, a high school in Don Benito, a literary meeting with Antonio Iturbe, author of The Librarian of Auschwitz. Students in Fourth of Eso were able to ask both the author and Dita Kraus, the protagonist of the book, their doubts and concerns. The life of Dita Kraus is truly exceptional, worthy of a movie. In fact, to a student's question, Antonio Iturbe did not rule out writing in the future a theater play about her life. In 2020, Dita Kraus, at the age of 90, wrote her memoirs. Without further ado, this is how Dita tells the story of her life. I remember a happy childhood. I lived with my parents in Prague. We were a middle-class family. The house where we lived was known as the electric house, because in the basement there was an automatic washing machine that was used by all the neighbors for their laundry. It was famous all over Prague. My parents liked music and operas. They used to go to concerts. They played the piano very well, and I enjoyed it a lot when they played the piano four hands. However, everything changed with the arrival of the Germans. The first time I heard the word Jewish was in third grade. The year was 1938. One morning at school, I found a piece of paper in my desk that read, You're Jewish. I did not know what was happening, and I brought it back home to show it to my parents. They got really serious and I knew something bad was happening. The war began when I was 10 years old and father was fired from his job being Jewish. The Germans requisitioned our apartment. Bit by bit, the number of restrictions increased. We had to hand over our belongings, such as jewelry, bicycles, musical instruments. We couldn't go to theaters, cinemas, cafes, restaurants, parks. Jewish people couldn't travel nor leave the boundaries of the city. They sealed our identity documents with a J for Jewish, and they imposed a curfew at 8 o'clock in the evening. However, the hardest hit was when children were prohibited from going to school. On the 1st of September 1940, the school year started as usual in Czechoslovakia, but not for me, nor for any Jewish child. We had to move again. A German official ordered the building to be evicted because he wanted it for himself. Jewish people could not live anywhere, only in the Jewish ghettos, when each apartment sheltered three or four families. One day, they imposed a new restriction. We had to wear a yellow star that said Yud on our clothes. On the 20th of November 1942, they forced us to move again. This time, our destination was the ghetto of Terencin. And from there, they moved us to the final destination, Auschwitz concentration camp. The train ride was painful. They pushed us on the train. The sliding door of the wagon closed suddenly. We were stuck in a livestock wagon. There was a bucket to relieve ourselves, and we had to do it in front of everyone. It filled up very quickly, but we had no way to empty it. It is simply impossible to describe the stench. The lack of fresh air, I do not remember how long the ride was. Maybe two days and one night. Maybe two nights and one day. We took turns to sit. We arrived at our destination at midnight, and under some building lights, we were pushed off the train. We had arrived at Auschwitz. They registered me, tattooing on my forearm the number 73,305. We were utterly disheartened. There was not a single spark of joy left, and we did not want to be alive. But we had to continue. Our hell was about to begin. The worst was yet to come. Mother and I were put together in Block 6, a woman's bank house. Six women in narrow bank beds with a thin blanket, a hay mattress, the clothes we were wearing, a spoon and a bowl. That was everything we had. My father did not last very long. He died in Osbridge just a few weeks after our arrival. 
he was simply drained of all energy until he could not get up from his bed. Father was 44 years old. I worked as a librarian in Block 31, a day center for children destined to die in the gas chambers, in a matter of months. Freddy Hirst was the one that had entrusted me with the job. I was 14 and a half years old when he made me the person in charge of the smallest library in the world. I do not remember the numbers of samples, but it did not reach a thousand. In Auschwitz, we were all afraid of Dr. Mengele. The third selection finally came. The doctor decided who could be still useful to work and who should die. My mother and I were in the group destined to live. Around uh, 1,500 women were sent from Auschwitz to work as slaves at Hamburg. The other 7,000 people, the old, the weak and the children, were murdered in the gas chambers in July of 1944. I still do not know how we avoided death. After some war camps, they sent us to the concentration camp of Bergen-Belsen. In every concentration camp I knew, the only cooked dish they served the prisoner was soup. In this camp, we were liberated by the British. But one or two days passed between the German guards leaving and the British soldiers arriving. The camp was full of corpses. I did not feel pity or sympathy. I understood that what I was seeing was a horror that escaped human comprehension. Yet I did not feel any emotion. I moved and passed over the corpses. We were dangerously skinny. How curious is the economy of the human body? First, when we were at the ghetto, we stopped menstruating, as if the body has decided that it was a waste to lose blood. Then, the layers of fat disappeared, and when everything has been absorbed, the valley loses its roundness and it becomes a ball, with the pelvic bones and handles. When I was standing up with my legs together, I could feel my entire hand between my thighs. A group of gypsy girls caught my attention. I passed with my friend Margaret in front of them. A few minutes later, she asked me, Did you see it? I said that I didn't know what they were cooking in the can. You didn't see it? She asked again. After a long pause, she said, It was a liver. I had just seen an act of cannibalism. I do not know what I would have done if the gypsies had invited me to join them. I want to think I would have said no, but I am not sure. A few days after the liberation, mother died of typhus. I was left alone. I did not know what was going to happen. I went back to Prague. There I was alone in my natal city, about to be 16 years old, alone. I had lost my father and my mother. One morning, I was in a queue for the Ministry of Interior when I recognized Otto Kraus, one of the educators in the bank house 31. He invited me to the theater and I ended up marrying him. After the communist government of Czechoslovakia had expropriated the lingerie factory that Otto had inherited from his parents, we moved to Israel. We became part of a kibbutz. I had three kids and when my husband died, I bought a little apartment in Prague, where I passed long seasons. Some years ago, a Spanish writer, Antonio Durbe, became interested about my life and wrote a book that made me famous, The Librarian of Auschwitz. And now, at the age of 90, I've decided to publish my memories. In April 2021, Iturbe surprised me when he told me that he was going to give a talk about his book at a Spanish high school and that the students want to ask me some questions. I think it was a very interesting initiative to divulge among young students what happened to youth in the Holocaust. Has it ever bothered you that so many people know your story? Hello. No, it hasn't bothered me. There are no personal secrets about me in the book. What did bother me was that Antonio Durbe described me as more courageous than I was in reality. 
it's good that he wrote the book. Thanks to it, many people in many countries know what was Auschwitz. What do you think of the Nazis who are still alive and those who deny everything that happened? There are not many Nazis alive any longer. When I come across deniers who said it never happened, I look at the tattooed number on my arm. There exist so many documents of concentration camps that only an absolute ignoramus can say they did not exist. Sometimes I hear such absurd lies that I just become speechless. This tragic experience has surely been a difficult state to go through. How do those memories affect your daily life? Good question. The Holocaust is a constant present in my life. It is no longer painful, but it has influenced me in many ways. For example, my children had no grandparents, uncles or aunts. The terrible hunger in the camps taught me never to waste food. What do you feel in regards of being Jewish? Have you ever rejected your identity as a Jewish? I come from a completely unreligious Jewish family. We never went to a synagogue and did not eat kosher food. I never felt different from my non-Jewish friends. Only when Hitler started the persecutions of Jews did I become aware that I am Jewish. One cannot reject being Jewish because it is both a religion and a nationality. A Frenchman can be Catholic or a Protestant, but he will always stay a Frenchman. No such option for us, the Jews. Nowadays, do you have nightmares about when you were in Auschwitz? No, fortunately I don't dream about Auschwitz. But I often dream about my mother or my grandmother, and in my dreams they are alive and I feel so happy. Only then I wake up and I am so disappointed that it was only a dream. Have any library books been preserved? The camp was liquidated after the lucky prisoners were sent to hard labor in Germany and the unlucky majority were killed in the gas chambers. Nothing remained of the camp. Did you ever lose hope of getting out of Auschwitz alive? What was your worst moment there? What was your best moment? Well, these are three questions. About losing hope, I had an inner voice telling me I will not die. But in reality, this was just a silly belief, a kind of self-delusion. The worst moment was not one, but all together. Terrible hunger, cold, dirt, vermin. A best moment was when I got a boiled egg from a Polish prisoner. What message would you like to send to the new generations in relation with the Holocaust? My message is, when you have children one day, teach them not to hate. All the misery of the world stems from hatred. How was your arrival at the family camp? Our transport arrived at night. We had been squeezed in a cattle wagon for two days. Couldn't sit, no toilet. When the train stopped, Men in striped clothes with sticks hit us to jump out. Men and women were separated, girls with mothers, boys with fathers. In a barrack, we had to undress in the freezing cold and take a shower. We didn't get our things, only some old clothes, no food, no water. Then we stood for many hours to get the tattoo number on the left forearm. It was only the beginning of our suffering. Did you ever think of giving up after your father died without being able to say goodbye to you under those conditions? I never thought of giving up. It is the human instinct of all living things, actually. That the worse the conditions are, the stronger becomes the desire to live. In Auschwitz, people died daily. There were no funerals. The bodies were collected on a platform and brought to the crematoria. No one was allowed to go with them. Tita's answers wrapped up the literary meeting about the librarian of Auschwitz, celebrated in IES Donoso Cortés with students of Fourth of ESO and the presence of Antonio Iturbe. The objective that we all share after this meeting is that the Holocaust never happens again.